Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, or Luke 11. Luke 11. <clears throat> and uh, maybe you want to get a seventh inning stretch if you'd like to stand for the reading of God's Word, unless you're not able physically, or if you're an extra big giver and you'd rather just stay seated, say amen right there. I hope you, hope you like good humor because I'm full of it, amen? That, that's how you keep a crowd's attention. They asked Charles Spurgeon one time, <clears throat> what should you do when people fall asleep in church? You know what the prince of preacher said? He said, somebody ought to wake up the preacher. That preacher was, a preacher was preaching one time and some guy in the back row was, you know, falling asleep and the preacher got mad, you know, and he yelled over to the guy that was sitting next to him. He said, hey, wake that guy up over there. I yell back at him, you put him to sleep, you wake him up, amen. <laughs> so don't mind me, I've got to kind of be a little funny up here, but at least, you know, I'll hold your attention, okay? And I'm, I pastored two churches before in my life. I love God's people, and I would rather preach something like I'm going to preach now than preach on Illuminati or Israel, all these interesting subjects. I'd rather preach something like when I was a pastor before, okay? So this is for you tonight. See if it can get some, get some help to you. All right, Luke chapter 11, verse 1. <clears throat> and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. That is the only subject the Bible records that the apostles ever asked Jesus to teach them about. And Mark says he has done all things well. He did, a, he did everything. But that's the only thing that's recorded. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven so on earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. See that one line there? That shows you that's not the Lord's prayer, no matter how many times you hear that expression. How many sins did the Lord ever commit? All right, this, and this is not even a, the church's prayer. This is a prayer for Israel. The church's prayer would be closer to the upper room prayer in John 17. But this is, a, this is an outline for prayer. You want to pray? Jesus said, okay, if you're going to pray to, my, to our Father as in Jews, here's how you pray. Do this way. It's, he's teaching them. It's not his prayer. His prayer, again, is in John 17, right? He didn't commit any sins, did he? For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, we sure do love you. I feel a warm, warm spirit in this room. I don't mean temperature. I mean spiritual uh, temperature. And uh, I appreciate that. Some very sweet people. I got to meet so many of them earlier. Please let me be a help to them now. We're all going to need you. We're all going to need you between now and that rapture. I mean, we're pre-tribulation rapture, but we're post-perilous times as well. We've got to go through some things to get to the rapture. And we know that's why you call it the blessed hope. We're going to have to get through some stuff. Help us now tonight maybe to have our prayer life sharpened. We'll thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, turn over real quick to the book of Acts, uh, ch chapter 23. I want to start off by pointing out, is it okay to take my coat off then too, preacher? Is it? I'm going to start off by pointing out that, you know, most Christians don't even, don't even know what the word pr prayer means. How do you like that? Say, I know, what pr I know what it means. Do you know what it means? Let let's take a quick check, okay? Do you know what the word pray means? Look over here at uh, chapter 23. Uh, verse um, 18. Paul's locked up. He's got his nephew helping him out. He's sending a messenger to the top enchilada over there. Look at verse number 18. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and look at that next word. Prayed me to bring this young man unto thee. God's not within 100 miles of that verse, but somebody's praying. Am I right, Pastor? You all see the word in the English text? Look at chapter 24, verse 4. Uh, Notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. How about that neighbor? God's nowhere around there. That's because the word pray has a particular English meaning. You all got a courthouse nearby here? A whole town's named that. They got... Courthouse Road, Courthouse Avenue, all these streets. I've been down in this area before. You know what they say down at that court? They say, we petition the court. You ever hear that? 
You know where that comes from? That comes from a English jurisprudence expression that's outdated now, but they used to say, and some of you old timers might remember the expression, we pray the court. Today it's we petition the court. If you look up the word prayer in a dictionary, it just means to make a request. Now, with that in mind, I want to show you something. This is a strange sermon. How strange is it? How about if I give you the title? right now. The title of this message is, Are You as Smart as a Fifth Grader? That's the title of my sermon. I say, what's that got to do with prayer? Hang around. I say, you don't know me. When this, when this service is over, you're going to be crying when I leave. But when you got to get used to me, because I, I, I come in like a tornado. And then people, what was the license plate of that truck? But people that know me, I mean, that's how I got so many churches to go to. But I sneak up on you. That's my style. You hang around. You're going to see where this is going to go. Hold your attention that way. I said, are you as smart as a fifth grader? What has that got to do with anything? Well, turn to Romans and you'll see. Hurry up. Uh, I'm going to hurry, hurry, hurry so I don't get too long here tonight. Romans chapter 10. Now, what the Bible teaches is the Lord wanted those Jews to get saved, and one of the ways that God was reaching out to them, he got one of their own, you know, Saul of Tarsus converted to the Apostle Paul, right? And then what did he do? He sent them after the Gentiles, right? You know why he did that? To make the Jews jealous. Get them mad so they, they would come in and get converted. Want to see the verse that tells you that? Look at chapter 10, verse 19. Romans 10, verse 19. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Now jump over to chapter 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. You all see that? So the Lord likes to yank people's chains. He's God. He does anything he wants to do. He's always right. He's always got a reason whether we understand it or not. Now, here's, here's the direction of this message now. God wants you to have the best prayer life that you can have. But because he wants you to have the best prayer life you can have, and he's your father and my father, and we're his children, right? He's got a real strange way of teaching us about prayer. One of many ways, they asked him, teach us how to pray, Jesus. Those are a bunch of Jews. Now, we're Christians in here, and we need God to teach us how to pray. There's all kinds of different ways you can learn. But boy, did he show me something wild about 35 years ago. It's got everything to do with the, the, the concept behind that crazy show, Are You As Smart As A Fifth Grader? I never saw 30 seconds of that show. I hope I'm not wrong, preacher, to blow my whole sermon. I have an idea of what the show is supposed to be about. I guess it's like, you know, can, you know they got high technical questions at a technical age, maybe today and in school, you know, and then uh, uh, our older parents, you know, like most of the time our grandkids got to show us how to use our, our smartphones, right? And so you may be not, you couldn't handle the, the questions fifth graders again. I think that's what it's about. But that's meant to intimidate you for a little bit, like your little kid, your little grandkids know more than you know. Now God's got the, that's what he was doing with the Jews. He's, he's, he's intimidating them. He's trying to make them jealous by having Paul chasing after all those Gentiles. Now God's got something just like that with respect to prayer. And you're not going to believe where this is going. Turn to Mark real quick. Mark chapter number 5. And here it is, a wild story here about this maniac of Gadara. You all remember Johnny Pope, uh, pastor? He used to, he had a sermon on this story. It was called The Nude Dude in a Rude Mood. You remember that? That's 30 years ago. So you got this, uh, yeah, you got, in Mark 5, you just see one demon-possessed guy. But in Matthew and, uh, and in Luke, you can tell there's two men that have devils in them. But in Mark, it just centers on one of the two. That's not a contradiction. That's just God centering on one of the two for his own reason, okay? So this one guy's filled with demons, with devils, and he meets the Lord. And watch what happens. This is going to blow your mind. Verse 1, and they came over unto the other side of the sea in the country of the, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains. 
because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tomb. That's the third time you can see that tombs mentioned. Crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of, God, son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Now see, this looks like it's the man talking to Jesus, but it's the devil's channeling through the man. It looks like the man, but it's them. You'll see that in the next verse. Look at verse 9. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he... Uh, 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 um, and he besought him much that he would not send them out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Now watch verse 13. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea and were choked. And there were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. I, me I mentioned son of Sam, David Berkowitz, in New York prison. I visited him four times. First time I visited him, we got talking about this story. And he said, that was me right there, verse 15, after I got saved. He was just full of the devil, and he's shooting people because he thought a dog was telling him to kill people. The next-door neighbor's name was Sam, and the dog was the neighbor's dog. And that's where he got the nickname Son of Sam. Verse 16, and they that saw it told them how it befell to them, to him that was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. Hello, neighbor. Watch verse 17. And they began to, what's the next word? There it is. See it? They began to pray him to depart out of their coast. See what they're doing? They're not praying that we, like we think of praying. They're just asking him to get out of here, right? But look what the Lord does. Uh, and when he was coming to the ship, it doesn't even tell you that he left. He just, that's, 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 that's understood. Hey, they, they got their prayer answered. He left. He that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. There it is again. But this time the Lord sends him, he sends him home, doesn't let him stay with him, and we'll cut off the reading right there. Now put your seatbelt on. Now, I don't want anybody falling out of your chair and hitting your head and, on the ground and causing a lawsuit. You need any lawsuits, Pastor? All right. Get ready now. Did you hear about that Jewish doctor that gave his patient six months to live and the guy didn't pay his bill, so he gave him another six months? I don't know if you heard that joke. I got a lot of Jewish jokes from that Israel book, I'm telling you. You know why the Jews wandered 40 years in the wilderness? Anybody ever heard that one? Somebody lost a quarter. Say amen right there. All right. Now, I'm, I'm getting you ready now. I'm getting you ready for a shock. Right? Anybody see those devils get three prayers answered in five minutes? Maybe that shot over your head. It always does, no matter how many times I've preached this message. It just blew right past you. Do you hear what I said? Do you notice the devils? The, those devils, right? Did you notice how they got three prayers answered in ten minutes or five minutes or less? Do you happen to notice that? What are you talking about? Did you forget what prayer means already? You didn't forget that, did you? Prayer is asking. John Rice wrote a book, Prayer, Asking and Receiving. Sold six million copies. What do you mean? What do Slow down. What are you talking about? Don't torment us. Is that what they asked? Anybody see them get tormented? I guess they got that request. Don't send us out of the country. I didn't see Jesus boot them out, did you? I guess they got that one. And then they said, hey, see, can we go into those pigs over there? The next word says forthwith. Jesus gave them leave, and out they went. I guess that was one, two, three. How are we doing? Are you as smart as a fifth grader? When's the last time you got three prayers answered in five minutes? I can't hear you all talking at the same time. <laughs> See? The Lord's playing with your brain tonight. I've only been doing this same sermon 35 years. God uses it all the time. God's messing with you for your own good because he loves you. You don't think a bunch of devils got better prayer lives than you do, do you? That's the angle. See it? 
Are, are, are your prayers as good as a pack of devils? Are you as smart as a fifth grader? And we're walking. <laughs> and we're walking. Let me ask you a question. Who do you think God would rather answer, a pack of devils or one of his children like you and I? Sure, he wants to answer your prayers. He'll use this story to mess with you for fun. Crazy, isn't it? Now watch. Here's the here's the cool part, right? Ready? So, well, well I, I want to be I want to be as good a prayer warrior as those devils. That's the angle. Right? That's the idea. So here's the deal. Would you believe those devils followed seven principles on prayer that are taught in the Word of God in this little story that we just read? They practice seven principles. And if you practice them, your prayer, your answers go up to percentages just like theirs is. All you got to do is get as smart as a bunch of devils. Number one, they prayed reverently. Reverently. Do you all see what this says? When, they, when, they saw, when, they, when the man ran up to Jesus, what did he do? It said he worshiped him. Did you see that? And he said, Art, he said uh, who, uh, what, uh, thou, thou son of the most high God. I got the right verse there. Is that what it says? Look at verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. You all see that request came in after he worshipped him? And after he praised his name, did you see that? Why is that? Well, maybe they were listening in when Jesus was teaching those 12. When you pray, pray this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, give me my daily bread. Is that what, is that, see? No, 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 before you get to the dead, give me the daily bread ministry. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. See? See that? There's an old expression that say fools rush in. You might want to spend some time telling God how wonderful he is before you get around to telling him what you want. Amen. And while you're at it, I'm ta I'm ta I'm not, this is not an infomercial for my book now, but you ought to be smart enough to know God would be pleased if you were interested in what he's interested in. I don't think the very next thing in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's all before you get around to asking him what you want. You know why David was special to God? God said, I found a man after my own heart. Thinks like I do. Amen. I'm glad you folks care about Israel. That's a big deal. That's the idea. Amen. The Muslims don't care about Israel. Okay. So they prayed reverently, okay? Number one. Number two, this is heavy. They prayed scripturally. They prayed scripturally. Oh, this is so good, I can't believe it. Uh, you go over to, uh, we're not going to flip back all through the other passages, but if you go over to a parallel passage over in Matthew 8, there's a verse there in verse 29, Matthew 8, 29, same story. Here's what those devils say. Watch. They say, art thou come to torment us before the time? Did you catch that? Did you get that? You know, Jude and Peter talk about the angels, the fallen angels reserved and changed until the day of judgment. And those devils understood that their punishment is not till later. And they put it on the Lord to back them up. Did you see that? That's deep. Art thou come to torment us before the time? You know what Jesus said? Okay, you got me there. And he loves that when we pray that way. That shows you have faith in the Word of God. I had a picture of my unsaved father in the front of my Schofield Bible for 30 years, sitting there drinking a cup of coffee in a kitchen, burden for him, unsaved man, praying for him 30 years. I had that picture in my Bible. It had Galatians 6-9 written on top of the photograph. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. I showed that picture to God 10,000 times probably in my burden and prayer tears streaming down my face different times. Lord, you told me I'd reap if I don't faint. Here's your verse. Come on. Amen. I got to baptize my father in front of 7,000 people at First Baptist Church one night after an evangelist led him to the Lord. Yeah. Took 30-something years. That point, number two, right there, right there, right? The one we just covered now? Saved my, saved my wife's life this year. Do you understand what I just said? It's, she, that saved my wife's life, literally, literally. 
Her mother died of COVID two days before Christmas in Dover, Delaware, in an extended living facility, 90 years old. We were there with her. We both caught COVID. Had to cancel the funeral and just bury the body and put the memorial service off, you know. And I'm cutting out a zillion points here for time. <clears throat> and I was perfectly fine. I, had, I didn't even have a runny nose. My wife was a little wobbly, lost her taste. And anybody in here you have COVID, raise your hand. I'm curious. Wow. And she had it, and she was doing okay. And I went off to preach in Texas because my daughter was there with her, and she, my wife was a nurse but uh, before, and she, wasn't, she was okay. But while I was in Texas, she took a nosedive. Her temperature dropped down to 84, I mean, her oxygen level, blood clots all over the place, double pneumonia, seven, 69 years old, little bit of high blood pressure. It was not looking good, Brenda. I'm driving through Natchitoches, Texas, crying my little eyes. I'm wondering what's going on out of nowhere. And God gave me so much liberty out of nowhere. And he laid that verse on me, my own sermon. He reminded me of my own sermon. And it, it, uh, here's the verses that came into my mind. Art thou, why wilt thou die before thy time? Over there in Ecclesiastes 7. And then the Lord brought that amazing passage in there in Exodus. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be what? Thank you. And all of a sudden, God gave me the liberty to, to, to break out bad with him. Yeah, there's a verse that says, come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't know if you read that. A lot of Christians can't do that because they don't live close enough to God to do it when they need to be able to do it. David poured out his complaint before the Lord. You ever see that verse? And all of a sudden, I said, Lord, something's messed up here. Remember, remember Clarence, the angel on uh, the Wonderful Life? I said, you got some Clarence on this project here? My, are you telling me my wife is going to die before her time? Die sooner than she would have because she took her life into her hands to visit her dying mother who had COVID? I think that was honoring her mom, wasn't it? I guess she's supposed to live longer for doing that. What the heck's going on here? That's exactly how me and the Lord had it out. And I reminded him of my own sermon. Did you ever hear my sermon, Lord, about the, you know, are you smart as a fifth grader? Art thou come to torment us before the time? I said, come on, Lord, I, I got you. If I'm lying, may the you know, Lord smack him in the head if I'm making this up. Guess what happened? Hey, he made, she made a U-turn in 24 hours. She was home in three days with a little few oxygen tanks. Ten days later, flew up to Michigan with me. She's doing jumping jacks right now. She's fine. Hey, I'm going to shock you with a statement. Ready? Ready? King James Bible? Could be true. Could be true, couldn't it? The ladies can't handle sarcasm. You men know I'm joking, right? <laughs> did I ask that waitress today at the pizza joint? Did I ask her? Did I tell that lady? I said, ma'am, with a straight face. I said, I just want you to know we've been known to tip as high as 10% in some places. She just, they, the waitresses always get mad at you when you say that. The, the waiters laugh. They know you're just pulling their leg. Oh, I'm starting to lose the women now. They're the best book buyers. You should see me when I walk up, go up to the McDonald's drive-up window and I say, uh, lady, do you, uh, you all take uh, a Hawaiian money here? <laughs> this got back from Hawaii. You take Hawaiian money here? Hey, three quarters of them say, let me check, or I don't know, or no, we don't do it. Then I'll ask them, you have any idea? You ever heard of Hawaii? You have any idea where it is? Amen. They prayed reverently, number one. They prayed scripturally, number two. I love this. Number three, they prayed specifically. They prayed specifically. You know what they said? Don't torment us. That's a specific request. Uh, don't send us out of the country and send us into those there pigs over there. Those are specific requests. What, what, what is that? What's, what's that got to do with anything? Do you realize that most Christians, when they pray, Pray general prayers. Lord, bless my pastor. Lord, bless the missionary. Am I, are, you, are you out there? You, you get that? Why is that? Insecurity. When you ask God for something specific, you'll find out whether you got it or not. And most of us are like Rodney Dangerfield. You know, he said when he was a little kid, when it was time to play hide and seek, nobody looked for him. You know, most of us got that, you know, I'm, I'm a loser kind of attitude back here. And you don't want to get more evidence that you're a dip, dip wad by, because you can't get prayers answered. So you play it safe with general prayers. And that's just a very deep thought I just showed you. I'm serious. In other words, it takes faith 
to pray for specific things. I preached for a friend of mine in, uh, in uh, Ohio one time when I was a teacher along with Brother Crockett here, Bruce Engelman, you know him, over there at the, in Ohio, Circleville. And anyway, Sunday night, the sermon was over, and I wanted to go home, you know, it was four hours away from where I live in Indiana as I was a teacher. And all of a sudden, uh, I mean, at the offering, at the offertory time, I'm sitting on the platform, and the plates are going by, and I had one $20 bill in my pocket from the, uh, the, I sold sermon tapes in those days, and I only sold one set of tapes, and the Lord said, well, what, what, the plate's going by, son, you're gonna, th- you're gonna put something in there. So I said, Lord, all I got is a 20. He said, he said so. I said, Lord, don't you know Brother Engelman, he's a tightwad, he's not gonna give me any kind of a decent offering. And, Lord, and then the Lord said this, ready? And I hope, you, I hope you know the tone of voice here, ready? The Lord said, okay. How many of you know what that means? You know, the Lord doesn't shake hands like a missionary, okay? He's not hard up. Uh, He said, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. You know, I don't think he needs our money, do you? I see. He said, okay. And then I knew what that meant. I said, okay, hold on, Lord, okay. So I got my 20, preacher. And as the offering plate went by, I ran up to it, came down off the plant, threw that 20 in there. And and then I watched it, Brenda, as it was sailing away, you know, going up and down everybody's lap. I'm watching that 20 go out of the, off to the horizon, you know. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen, Brother Greg. But here's the killer part. I said to the Lord as my 20 was sailing into the distant sunset, I said, now, Lord, listen, I, I promise you I said this. Look, you say you think preachers are perfect? We're messed up, you're messed up, and we're messed up. We're just not as messed up as you. Or we'd be out of a job. Amen. Am I right, Christ? I said, Lord, if you give me that, if you're going to give it, it shall be given to me. I know you're going to give me uh, something back for because of the 20. I said, but if you give it to me like two months from now, I'm going to miss the connection. I said, can I have it tonight, Lord? I promise you. Can I have it tonight, Lord? Then we had the service, and I preached a, a message. We had a wonderful altar call. It was a great night. Then I'm ready to leave. Four-hour drive to go back to Indiana. And right at the end, the pastor closing the service said, Brother Grady, hold on a minute. And they had a, a stage crew come out, and they, did, they unbolted the pulpit and took the pulpit away. And then uh, they brought a big chair out, you know, like a throne type of looking chair. And he said, Brother Grady, would you have a seat there? This is one of my former students now. And then he dismissed the church. They all went out of the building. I didn't know what was going on. Then out comes another couple, you know, and, and a man and his wife and one of their in-laws and husband and wife in-laws and two guitars, and they start singing. There, there is an unseen hand. Now, there is a hand unseen by men. You're yeah, pretty soft. Nobody's in the auditorium. I'm thinking he's having flashbacks to when he was a lost guy. He was a, he was a newscaster for NBC affiliate in Pittsburgh. I think he powdered his nose quite a bit in those days with that fast crowd he ran with. I thought he's having flashbacks. I said, what? I got to get out of here. And then all of a sudden, the door is opened up in the back, and here come the whole church back in the building, coming down the center aisle, all of them carrying food items. And he's over here with a microphone commentating. Brother Grady, that's Charmin Baptist, you're there. You know, give me all the brand names. And they're laying all this food up on the platform. I mean, one after another. Here's an th- old lady with three teeth in her head carrying a big apple pie. And I wasn't looking at anybody's face by that time. You all with me ahead of time, ahead of, the, ahead of me on this now? Say, so you know what, I was, what were you doing? I was looking down at the ground. And all I kept hearing in here was, can I have it tonight, Lord? Can I have it tonight, Lord? I don't mean it was a half a bag of groceries. The entire platform was filled. The pastor had to loan me his brother and his, in his brother's car so two vehicles, mine and his brother's, could drive it four hours back to bring all the groceries back. They had the receipts from Strachan Van Til's on 30 and 41. Had the receipt. It was $950 worth of stuff. That's, a, that's 30 years ago. And they say, so here's a $50 gift certificate It's tracking Van Til's so you can buy some ice cream and steak or something, round it off to an even grand. I was crying. Some girl runs up to me. She said, Brother Grady, I don't know why the Lord told me to do this, but I was supposed to, he told me I was supposed to give you this. They prayed specifically can I have it tonight, Lord? That's putting myself on the spot, and God, too, will see what, if I get through or not. 
And most of us don't like praying that way because we don't want to see the fact that we can't get through. Maybe God wants to teach you a few things. There's plenty of things in the Bible that tells you why you won't get your prayers answered. He that turneth his ear away from the hearing of the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Make sure you husbands give honor to your wives that your prayers be not hindered. There's plenty of explanations if you want to find out why you can't get prayers answered. But I just wanted to know if you're as smart as a fifth grader. These devils don't know more about praying than you do, do you? Or do they? Remember, God's yanking your chain for fun because he loves you. Number four, they prayed fervently. Verse 10, and he besought him much. We were talking about this tonight, preacher, about fasting and prayer, right? Verse uh, 12, and all the devils besought him. You ever read that verse in Philippians 4? Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. So what's supplication? That's when you know what carpet fiber smells like because you stay on the ground crawling around for a while. I, lo I launched my book, Final Authority, at Dan Woodridge Church in Dwight, Illinois, in March 1993, after 40 days of going without eating anything. Jesus said, you want to cast devils out of a man? You couldn't do it. I did it. You want to know why I could do it? You couldn't do it. This kind cometh forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. Sometimes you got to have some fervent prayer. They prayed reverently, scripturally, specifically, fervently. My wife and I prayed for our unsaved brother. Her brother, my brother-in-law, prayed for him for 42 years before I led him to the Lord on his deathbed with cirrhosis of the liver, big belly, football, bowling ball-sized belly. Led him to the Lord. First words out of his mouth when he finished praying the sinner's prayer, he looked up and said, I guess I got to start reading my Bible now and going to, going to church, he said. Wobbled to the church service for two more weeks and then died. Happy. Sometimes it's a long time you got to pray for things fervently. Number five, they prayed collectively. They prayed collectively. Look at verse 12. And all the devils besought him. A lot of times God wants you to band together with one another. You have some sick moral problems. All of us attempted with different things. You don't share some of that crazy stuff with one another. But if you're a lazy, you know, guy, you can't get up in the morning, you know, confess your faults, hello, one to another, pray with me about this, I got a burden, you know, that type of thing, that's good for, humility is good for the soul. All those devils were praying together. That's what's good about preaching your prayer meeting emphasis. And, uh, and by the way, I'm going to bring up something that has to do with your first lady over here. You know, when I was a, when I was a, a teacher at, at Howes Anderson College, 86 to 96, my, my, I have two children, two boys and a girl. My daughter was in high school, and she got kicked out of our Christian high school for being in a party where there was drinking and smoking going on. That's my way of covering for the fact that she was probably drinking and smoking, too. I just say she was in the party, you know what I mean? And, and I was at a meeting in uh, South Carolina. I was at a meeting in, in uh, Liberty, South Carolina, Golden Creek Baptist Church, Friday night, last night of the meeting. My wife called me that afternoon to tell me our daughter had been kicked out of the Christian school, tore my heart to pieces, right? I just got up then, preached my sermon. And when it was all done, I'm like this, closing my Bible up like this, you know, and I said, well, and I've been to this church many times. They knew me, loved me, I love them. I said, uh, folks, by the way, before I get out of here, I want to leave, leave a prayer request for, with you. From my daughter Sarah, she has some special spiritual needs. I appreciate that. God bless you. Like that. Look, close my Bible. Went right over here. Sit down. The pastor gets up over here to come to the pulpit. Before he could get to the pulpit, Brother Woodrow, Brother Woodrow, he's a he's a deputy, he's a sheriff's the sheriff in the county, about six foot six. They say uh, when they call for backup, that means Woodrow. <laughs> he, he stood up, second row, like this, little crooked finger like that. And he put his finger up back and said, he said, brother, pastor, real shy, humble, don't say three words in a year kind of guy. He says, I, I, I believe the, the Lord would have us pray for Sarah now. And half the church was at the altar in two seconds. There was no more room for anybody else. The rest of them fell down. I could cry right here. I swear, I promise you I could cry right here. It was that real. And they're all crying out to God. They never even met the girl. They're leaving the build. I'm, they're leaving it. I'm at the back door. We're praying for Sarah, Brother Grady, and they were. And then the Lord sent the pastor's wife right there, befriended my daughter at the college, 
and they became like little sister and big sister. The last thing I did before I got to, to the restaurant tonight when I'm meeting the preacher, I called my daughter and said, guess where I'm preaching tonight? And I said, the, the Crockett's, and she went crazy. See, she made a U-turn out of nowhere, my daughter did. And she and her husband pastored three churches so far. They got five little kids. Sometimes it pays to get folks to pray and share your burden with you. Number six, number six, they prayed, they prayed acceptably. They prayed acceptably, meaning in the will of God. You might want to make sure what you're asking God for lines up with the scripture, because I can see it now, preacher. Those devils inside the man, they're talking, right? Hey, man, we got to get out of here. Jesus is going to kick us out of here. And one devil says maybe to the other, this is Bill Grady uh, commentary. Hey, look at those horses over there. Why don't we ask Jesus if we can go in the horses? And I can see the top devil saying, are you stupid? Didn't you ever read that verse about pigs in Leviticus? God hates pigs. There's pigs right over here. There's a much better chance we get to those pigs. Leviticus 17, look it up sometime. Make sure when you're praying, you're praying in the will of God. You're praying for things that don't violate the word of God. And then number seven, they prayed believingly. They prayed believingly. Over there in Matthew, there's another expression. When they're looking at the pigs, it said that the pigs were, there was a swine, a herd of swine, a great way off, it says. I'm not turning it, turning, having you turn to it for time. You can look it up later. A great way off. See? See that? What, that, what does that mean? Most of us can pray to the Lord for $5 sometimes, right? But if you need $5,000 for a down payment on a house, you can't work up the faith for that. I mean, God could give me five, but I know it's 5000 be tough. Brother Howes used to tell the joke about the guy hitchhiking, you know. He had a bag of potatoes there and he, on, on the road, and he's hitchhiking. And a trucker picks him up, and he climbs into the cab of the truck and sits down. And he puts the bag of potatoes on his shoulder like that. Look, talking to the truck driver, you know, for about 20 minutes. And the truck driver keeps looking at him. Finally, he says, uh, hey, buddy. What's with the potatoes? Why don't you put the potatoes down? And old redneck says, hey, it's one thing for me to ask you to give me a ride. I'm not going to, I'll take care of my potatoes myself. Don't worry about the potatoes. That's how dumb we are. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and you can't get the faith to ask him for something big if you happen to need something big. My wife's father was from Eastern Shore, Virginia, D-Day invasion. 29th Division. He got lung cancer. We're praying for him. And I'm, in, I'm out in my church in Idaho with my wife. He's all the way 3,000 miles away. We're burdened for him. He's in a little dinky town of 100 people. He's lost. We didn't know what to do. You know God can take care of long-range burdens, you know, as well as short ones. If you told me this story, I wouldn't believe it. Ready? I'm cutting a lot of stories out for time because I want to leave you with a little surprise I'm going to give you next. Listen to this. You know what the Lord did? The, the Sanford, Virginia, population 100. All they got, they got a wash of teria over here as you start coming down the road. This is 40 years ago. A couple of old ladies sitting on washing machines in here and then dirt road. You go down another mile and there's Till's General Store on the left. One gas pump, post office box inside and a little general store and Till was about a 140 year old guy owned the place sitting there playing checkers on a barrel that's that's Sanford Virginia that was that's the whole thing that's where my lost father-in-law lived how you gonna how what are you gonna do there it's impossible yeah but I told you already that King James Bible could be true you know what happened Lord sent a King James Bible-believing independent Baptist church planter into Sanford, Virginia. My father-in-law's got six weeks to live. Starts a Baptist church. One building is all they got anywhere nearby. One church building, it's closed. It's a church of Christ. It's not even, nobody's using it anymore. Padlocked. He got permission to rent the building, opens it up and starts a Baptist church. Two weeks later, runs into my father-in-law. Leads him to the Lord. Two weeks later, my wife's there at the funeral, at his dying bedside, and then the funeral, and the preacher preaches the funeral. And two weeks after that preacher, he closes up the church and leaves town. You got a story like that in Acts 8, if you ever read it. The Ethiopian eunuch saw him no more as Philip was whisked away. Now, let me tell you something, neighbor. In Tennessee, everybody says, I'm a telling you, neighbor. I'm trying to be a southerner. I'm a telling you, neighbor. Biggest mistake you will ever make is when you see some preacher up there, especially like me, coming, an outsider, you know, telling you these wild stories, 
and, and also your pastor, biggest mistake you'll ever make is sitting there saying, oh, letting the devil talk to you. I wish I was a preacher, have cool stuff like that happen to me. Do any of you know what the difference is between a Baptist and a Protestant? I got pants on. I don't have a robe on. I'm not a Protestant clergyman. I'm a Baptist preacher. And there's no clergy and lady in a Baptist church. The ground is level. What God does for us, he'll do for you that fast. And you better have your stories or something's wrong with you. Don't think, don't goo goo gaga. Remember Paul and Barnabas? They, they wanted to worship him. Paul said, get out of here. Don't you do that. Okay. So are you as smart as a fifth grader? Did you need any of these points? Did God speak to your heart about any of these seven points? And the Lord said, you need this one. You are definitely out on that one. Did he do that? You know why he's doing that? Because he loves you. And he wants to improve your prayer life, but you've got to meet him halfway. Now, I'm done with this. Reverently, scripturally, specifically, fervently, collectively, acceptably, believingly. Now I'm done. I'm going to tell you the wildest thing you ever heard. Do you know the most important prayer in the history of America took place many years ago, and you'll never believe how it applies to you. I'm going to give you a, a real quick story, and you're just not going to believe it. It's that good, okay? America's in trouble there in the 1760s. We're heading toward a war with Great Britain, right? And uh, there's nothing going on in America. There's no religious liberty here. A Baptist preacher was given 39 lashes in Massachusetts, Obadiah Holmes, for preaching in a man's living room. There's no freedom of religion in the, in the country, you understand? The, the, the congregational Protestants are in the north, and the, and the Episcopal Church of England people are in the south, and they're, and they're stricter, they're rougher. It's a very terrible time. There are only seven Baptist churches up in the, uh, in, in the south. There was 40 up in the north and only seven Baptist churches in the entire south. 1750, 1760 was where we're looking at, right? Remember the Bible Belt? You all know that expression. It was in the north. There was no Bible Belt in the south. If you, the worst state was Virginia. If you lived in Virginia and you were, you were a Baptist and you had a baby born in Virginia and you would, and you would not turn it over to the, the, to the religious authorities to sprinkle it, you, they'd come in and take your cow. They'd come in and take your silver, ladies. Sometimes they put you in jail. Strict. Somebody said in the Episcopalian is a Catholic who flunked Latin. Tough. So God had to straighten that thing out. Now let me show you how he straightened it out. He sent a preacher into America named George Whitfield. You've all heard of him. He was, he was an Anglican, a Protestant, but he was a renegade Anglican. He was almost run out of the Church of England for his preaching. He wasn't a Baptist, but he was, a, he was preaching the gospel all the time. One of his, and, and, and God brought him to America to start an orphanage in Savannah, Georgia. And while he was over here, he started to preach. And people started getting saved everywhere. You've all heard of the Great Awakening, right? And one of the, and one of the, one of the, the uh, stiff uh, uh, you know, state clergymen said, uh, why do you keep preaching you must be born again, George? He said, because you must be born again. And he said, well, I'm sorry to see you here. He said, well, so is the devil. He said, get out of my way. And he preached and people getting saved all over the place. But here's the crazy part. Here's the crazy part. He came, went to England, came back to America. He made seven trips over here, 13 transatlantic crossings, fanning revival everywhere, all up and down this eastern seaboard. Now, here's the key part of the story. People getting saved left and right, and they're reading their Bibles, these people. They're saved now, and they're reading their Bibles, and the Lord is showing them that they need to get immersed. So they start getting baptized left and right, and the Baptist churches start filling up. See, God used this man like a secret weapon. The Baptists were not allowed to preach in the open. He had the credentials of a church of England, even though he was a radical, so he was allowed to preach everywhere. He preached to 20,000 people in Boston Common almost every week for two and three, four hours at a time. You know what the Baptist salute is, right? How many of you know what the Baptist salute is? Watch. 
and he's, he's going to town, man. People getting sick. And, and he makes a very funny statement in church history. Don't miss it. He's scratching his head, Brendan, when he's seeing all his converts joining Baptist churches. And this is what he says. He says, all my chickens have turned into ducks. <laughs> he doesn't know what's happening. God's pulling a fast one. Well, listen to this. He goes to North Carolina where it's really strict. And that's where they still don't have any churches established much because the persecution's too bad down there. And, and he goes down there and he goes to um, Bath, North Carolina. Bath, North Carolina is the oldest town in North Carolina on the beautiful Pemlico River. And he goes down there and all he's preaching to 20,000 people in Boston. He, uh, he, preaches, uh, he, he preaches to 100 people down there in this town. He wrote in his diary, he said, uh, I mean, um, what did he say in his diary? He said, I, I mean, a fiddle, a fiddle player is out, you know, bringing, drawing more people to listen to him than they would come to hear me, and he got mad. When he left the town, there's a bridge there. It's there to this day. As he crossed over the bridge, leaving Bath, North Carolina, he took his shoes off and he dusted his feet off and he put a curse on the town. He said, this town will never grow. I've been to that town. It's as dead as a hammer to this day. 50 people. They got a little museum in there because it's the oldest town in North Carolina. You go into the museum, they have a 10-minute film, and right in the middle of the film, it's a picture of Whitfield with lightning bolts and, you know, thunder and lightning, and he made their town famous because he cursed the town. They, they bring it out in a little speech. You got all this in his diary. Tells you exactly what I'm telling you now. I got all these quotes in any two of those books out there. He left Bath, North Carolina, and he spent a day traveling. This is in December, December, I forget the year. Preacher, he shows up in the next town, New Bern, North Carolina. You all go down there today, Walmarts, Hampton Inns, convention centers, booming place, New Bern. New, newborn town is what it was called back then. Today it's New Bern. And he preaches in the courthouse on Christmas Day, and two women come under deep conviction, they said. And he could tell God was doing something there compared to the other places. Now watch. This is the greatest prayer in American history, I'm going to tell you right now. Preacher, he was so shook up, the next day he's leaving to go somewhere else. He goes out into the pine thickets of North Carolina there, and he utters a prayer. I have the prayer in two of those books out there, verbatim as taken out of his diary, preacher. And this is what he says. I'm giving you the paraphrase version. Here's what he says. Oh, Lord, visit thy children in these colonies of the South. They have a tender heart for thee, but no doctrine and no preachers. Ready? Please send someone down here like John the Baptist of old, who would preach and baptize in this wilderness. I believe the multitudes would flock out to hear him. And by baptism, he meant sprinkling or pouring. You know, he's a Protestant Anglican. You know, the Lord knows what you really need. Don't even know yourself. That was his prayer. Guess what happened? Ten years later, he's preaching in Boston again. And there's a man out there from Connecticut a, a baby sprinkling congregational pastor with his wife and his brother-in-law and his wife and they're listening to Whitfield they're all, all, all four of them lost they hear the Whitfield preach and they all four of them get saved they go back to their church and congreg their congregational church that he's pastoring in Connecticut he preaches the gospel gets, them, gets all his people saved about ten more people all fourteen of them now are saved then they get reading their bible and they realize they gotta get dunked too so they call a Baptist preacher in Connecticut who comes and baptizes Shubal Stearns, the pastor. Then he comes up out of the water and he baptizes all his 13 people and now they got him a Baptist church. Amen. And then the Lord says, okay, it's time to answer Mr. Whitfield's prayer. <laughs> and wouldn't you know the Holy Ghost sends all 14 of those people right down to North Carolina. Anybody know where Burlington is? There's a little town there named Liberty. And they started the Sandy Creek Baptist Church in 1755. The man's name, the preacher's name is Shubal Stearns, little short guy. 
14 people, 1755. Within two years, the church is running 600 in the middle of nowhere. They're falling out of the trees getting saved. Whitfield said, send somebody down to this wilderness. Not only did God do that, but he had Whitfield get the guy saved himself. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not, but, but ye ain't heard nothing yet. Ye ain't heard nothing yet. Nothing. Ah, about 12 years later, the church is running 14, 15 again. 14, 600, 14. See what happened? Well, they, they all scattered. The men took their families, all of them surrendering to preach, and they took off to start churches. 1,000 churches were traced by 1,800 to that one little church, 1,000 Baptist churches. Go there and see if there's not a North Carolina historical marker on our highway that calls the Sandy Creek Baptist Church the mother of all separate Baptist churches of the South. And the separates were the shouting Baptists. You know, God wouldn't get mad if you ever said amen in the church service. That means I believe it. And these guys are shouting and jumping and running all over the place. And you do that, and the lost people say, something, something's going on in this place. Most of the, a lot of the churches I go to are as dead as Yankee Stadium at 4 o'clock in the morning. Jack Howes. Jack Howes used to talk about, he preached one sermon down in Harold Silas Church in South Carolina, Wild Church, Greenville. And while he's preaching it, the people jump up and pull the communion table out and run laps around the communion table like Indians. He said, I'd go to Canada and preach the same sermon in Canada, and the people would hold a sign up. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And he'd say, don't give me that junk that that's just your personality. He said, I've been to your hockey games. I imagine we can get excited about the stuff that makes us excited. The Lord usually gets at the back of the, tra you know, the train there. The separate Baptists were shouters and church builders. Now watch this. I'm watching my clock here. I know you don't normally go much past 8.15, but you don't usually have somebody as cool as me. Be honest, quick. <laughs> Help me now. Listen, let me ask you a question. How many preachers can write a 900-page book out there and tell you why Italians hate Jehovah's Witnesses? Do you know that why Italian? How many of you know why Italians hate Jehovah's Witness? Look at Mrs. Crockett. She's going, you know me, Brenda. You know why Italians hate Jehovah's Witnesses? They hate all witnesses. Come on, help me out here. I'm, I'm coming to you. It's going to be worth it. I'm coming to you. You know those men that took off? 500 men starting churches all over the place? You know 80% of them came to Virginia? Because God said, this is where liberty is going to be born. I could cry because I live with this. And I'm sorry to see my country dying, and it's dying right now. Amen. It is. January 18th, when the Trumps left and the Bidens came in, I was preaching that night in San Antonio. I tore my sh jacket to shreds at the pulpit, tore my shirt to pieces, and dumped a giant bag of dirt over my head that was in the pulpit that I put it there. So why'd you do that? I wanted God to know I was mourning with him. Not ashamed of that. Didn't do that for Facebook. This is real. This is real stuff. They went to Virginia, and they started churches all over this state, and the, and the officials went crazy, and they started locking these preachers up like that. And you know what these preachers did? They started having their church services inside the jail, with their people outside the jail. And they started preaching their sermons through the grates. And the congregations stood outside in the dirt. And the, 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 the magistrates went crazy. They locked the preacher up, but they're still preaching. Then they'd throw snakes at the people. They'd throw hornet's nests at the people. They'd get drunks on horseback to ride through the crowd to try to break them up. And the crowds kept coming. The people kept getting saved. This is your state now. Just want you to know this. Listen, listen, neighbor. I grew up in New York City, right? I've been to 47 countries. I've been to every state in this country, and I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. Never. Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Am I right? Sometimes you just, I'm telling you about your neighborhood here, and you may not know hardly any of this stuff. That's just the way life is. Here's a section in the back of my book called how some Baptists were persecuted in Virginia. 
and it's just page after page of Baptist preachers' names, last name, first name, county, and what happened to them? Afferman, last name, John, first name, Middlesex County, what happened to him? Cruelly beaten, incapacitated for work, right on down the list. Here's how my wife got saved, Elijah Baker, Accomack, Virginia. He's the guy that I beat him up, threw him in jail. He started all the churches on the Eastern Shore. That's, my wife was saved down there. How are you doing? Look, watch. How much time you got? Look. Huh. This is where America came from. Nobody knows this stuff. All that to say this. Out of all the preachers that were locked up and suffered like that, any stupid, these worthless preachers tonight, if, if I opened my church during COVID, I might get a ticket or a fine. <laughs> Tell that to John Bunyan, who spent 13 years in prison and said, I'd have mold go over my eyelids before I would deny my Lord. That's where Pilgrim's Progress came from. Bunch of pusillanimous excuses for preachers today. Listen, I'm done. Out of all the preachers, there was one that had the most outstanding story of all. They locked him up with five other preachers his name was John. And preacher, the people kept coming to hear him preach, getting saved outside his window. And the magistrate, this is worse than any other place they'd seen. Revivals breaking out outside the jail. So you know what they did? They didn't do this anywhere else in the whole state of Virginia. This happened in North Carolina as well, but Virginia was the hot spot. Preacher, I know you know the story. You know what they did? They built a stone wall. <laughs> Oh, by the way, the preacher, he'd put his hand out like this, you know, to, to make a point like a preacher will do it through the bars, and these guards were out there slashing his hands. There's all kinds of testimony about the day this man of God passed away, and, and, and he's laying in the casket. His hands were all sliced up. That's a very famous story. But now they build a wall 10 feet tall, stone wall in front of his bars that he's in a jail as it is now there's a wall built in front and they put glass like they did at the Berlin Wall glass up on the top so none of his people could get up there and sit up there see what well, that would be enough to make me quit yeah but this is the these are the real guys okay you know what they, you know what they did preacher let me show you what they did oh they're not going to quit what I'm telling you, neighbor, is a true story. Peter Jennings used to say, if you hear a rumor your mother loves you, check it out. I'm a footnote guy. Preacher, do you have a handkerchief in your pocket? Pastor, did your wife take care of you, fix you up, dress you up tonight? Did she give you a handkerchief? Huh? Always do Okay. I'm not going to bar anybody else's because you might have COVID. Do you know what they, those people showed up for church and there's a wall there tonight? You know what they did? The top deacon got them a handkerchief and a pole. And when everybody was out here waiting for the sermon, he's in there on the other side of the wall. They'd, you ever see people wave hankies in church? This is where it started. They threw that pole up there 10 feet and began waving that hanky like that, see? And he's waiting to see it in there. Because that's the sign that everybody's out there are waiting. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. They call that denying the prison bounds, what I'm just showing you. That's, what, that's the term, denying the prison bounds. Out the window, up over the stone wall, and the people out there getting saved all over the place. What's that got to do with America? You know who got this man out of jail? You ever heard of him? He was the governor of your state six times. I'll give you a hint. Give me liberty or give me death. Patrick Henry couldn't even win that case. He's the top lawyer in Virginia. The judges hated these preachers so bad. You know what he did? He took the money out of his own pocket and paid the fine. And later the preacher sent the money to Patrick Henry and Patrick Henry turned it away. James Madison saw this. Thomas Jefferson saw these things. Patrick Henry, George Washington saw these preachers locked up. 
and you want to know where the Bill of Rights came from? It's 100% Baptist lobby. 100% Baptist lobby. I have all the documentation in my books. John Leland, the Baptist preacher, was the one that got James Madison to put the Bill of Rights in. It's the most beautiful story you'll ever hear. I wouldn't even spend 10 more seconds trying to tell it to you because we're out of time. All I want you to know is that preacher that was locked up like that, by the way, his wife had 15 children at home, and he's, all, he's locked up for five months, and she's taking care of things. By the way, Patrick Henry became good friends with this preacher. They were neighbors. And guess what happened to Mr. Henry, if you don't know this? He got saved toward the end of his life, and he spent the last years of his life as an itinerant evangelist himself. Amen. That's documented, footnotes. I'm all done. Preacher, I'm so done. Oh, Lieutenant Colombo, remember? Just one more thing. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to know where that jail was because they put, a they put a memorial there. They got a stone wall with a giant brass plate on it with the six preachers' names on it. The monument is sitting right where the jail used to be so people can see it. And they got the plate on a stone wall because of how they had the wall in front of the man's jailhouse. Listen, neighbor, can you let the Lord bless you tonight? Are you, are you listening, neighbor? That stone wall is seven miles from this building. Chesterfield County Courthouse. That's where that man of God was locked up. And don't you think God has something special for you folks in this church to protect the heritage of the Baptist people as it's coming down to the end of the road? Somebody's got to hold the standard high tonight. You're walking in high cotton here and holy ground here. You ought to go down there and look at that monument on the wall because that's where Mr. Whitfield's prayer had its greatest answer because these are the men that got the Bill of Rights through for all of us. Hey, what's God got for you to do between now and the end of the church age? Let's bow our heads for prayer.